is a window of grace, a window of possibility. Amen. An opportunity that God is giving the body of Christ at this time Amen. to turn the tide. Amen. There's been a revival brooding over the land, but looking for an opportunity to settle in. And so if every one in the labor of the gospel has an accurate orientation it will be possible for the fortunes of the church to be actualized there yes there are dynamics that must be put in place in order to enhance the dream that god has for the nation and so we gather this morning as ministers of the gospel to to find that strategy that God will be using to transform this nation. Amen. So I welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you can, you may be seated. also informed that uh, we're supposed to do question and answer you want that okay no problem it's all right um, we'll, we'll just do um, we'll try to establish the seven ways that we can analyze your labor in the kingdom. There are seven ways that we can analyze it. To know whether what you're doing, you're doing it for God, or you're doing it for yourself, or you're doing it for the devil. And the reason why it is important for us to analyze our labors, are you with me? Now, let's follow this procedure Let's follow this procedure properly this morning. If, if you cannot but have your phone on, can you at least put it on silence so that your personal affairs will not distract us as a people this morning? Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Amen. So how many of us remember that in the Garden of Eden we had two trees, two major trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, two major trees. And the way God ordained it is that man will have to exercise his power, his sovereign power of choice in order to determine his lines of development. So there were two possible choices that he could choose from. And the first choice was the three of the knowledge of good and evil. The second choice was the three of life. Are you with me? Uh, the three of the knowledge of good and evil will make Adam independent from God. The tree of life will make Adam dependent on God. So the way of life is dependence. The way of death is independence. The principle that powers the body of Christ is the principle of interdependence. Did you get that? Now there's something that Pastor Jimmy has that I don't have. And so if I need that, God will not give it to me directly. I will need to identify Pastor Jimmy within the context of what he represents in the body of Christ. 
I will need to record. No, sorry, we don't do amens this morning. No amen. Just listen. If, if we need ventilation, I will know. So I will now say that's a good place to say amen. We'll now say amen together. Okay? All right. So I will need to recognize who Pastor Jimmy is in the body of Christ and the grace that God has put upon him. And I will relate with him as such in order for me to receive that strength that God has given him. So the principle that governs the operation of the body of Christ is interdependence, given that God has given all of us the Spirit of God in measures. It was only Jesus that had the Spirit of God without measure. So, I would need to recognize the grace of God upon your life. That, that is if I need what you have. There is a protocol that I must put in place in order for me to gain access to what you have. Are you there? Now, so, because there were two options for Adam, it means that there will always be two options for every one of us. And you can be running your ministry on the software of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can be running your ministry on the software of the tree of life. And it will interest you to know that when Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he became disconnected from God, separated from God. That's the spiritual meaning of death, to be separate from God. That means you are operating apart from God. So it is possible for you to be operating ministry apart from God. And you are so wise, so intelligent. You go to Cape Town, you go to Peter Marisburg, and you see the things that they are doing there, and then you say, okay, this is the trend. You are operating apart from God. Your strategy does not come from God. So if what you are doing is not drawn from an utter dependence on God, you are operating a different software. And don't get, don't, don't, don't misunderstand. If you operate a wrong software, you cannot have a right go end point. That thing that you are building will become a ground that Satan will stand upon to manipulate the destinies of men. Come with me. All right. That, my talk was, I was browsing. I was trying to find out uh, what the message was. So now I have the message. Matthew chapter 16. So since we are ministers of the gospel, we'll, we'll need to go deep so that we can help the people that we passed on. Matthew 16. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning from verse 13. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah's or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the 
the Son of the living God. And Jesus said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjuna, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. All right. If you read the book of Matthew, the last uh, campaign that Jesus had before what we are reading now in the book of Matthew chapter 16, the last campaign that Jesus had was in the West, Western Israel. Right? And after that campaign, Jesus refused. He went mute for the whole trip from west to east. Then the moment they got to Caesarea Philippi, <coughs> Jesus began to administer a questionnaire. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? This is the same Jesus that was not concerned about how people perceived him. He understood his mission and he was not trying to be a politician. In fact, one of those times they tried to make him king and he wiggled his way out of the crowd and because he was not interested. He was not interested in human agenda. He was not interested in political leadership. He knew the reason for which he came into this world. And then you now find the same Jesus administering a questionnaire to find out who men say that he was. Now, when I read that scripture, I wanted to find out what had changed. I said, well, you are, and I don't have time to explain why the people perceived Jesus to be John the Baptist. I don't have time to explain why the people perceived him to be Elijah. I don't have time to explain why the people perceived him to be Jeremiah. No time for this lecture. Because we will still have question and answer, so we need to uh, focus. Are you there with me? This was what actually happened. Um, I believe. Now, you know, this is one of those scriptures where if you are a good Bible teacher, sometimes you will need to go and ask God, what, what do you mean by this scripture? Why is this like this? And then he'll give you some insight. So this is the insight I got. The father had revealed to Jesus that there's somebody right in the crowd that I have revealed your identity to. So Jesus said, all right, I'm going to find out who the person is. You don't need to help me. Then he came back and began to administer a questionnaire. When he got the feedback from the crowd, he knew that the person was not in the crowd. So Jesus decided to reduce the sample space of the questionnaire. And then he now asked the apostles, who do you now say that I am? Then Simon came up. Simon reveals two major aspects of Jesus. He said, thou art the Christ, that's number one. What's, what's the meaning of that? Yeah? Yes, it's, it's the name of his office. It's the name of his ministry. All right? Don't forget that. Thou art the Christ. That's the first thing. Office and ministry was the first thing he captured. Thou art the son of the living God. That's his person. All right? Are you there? Office and person. So if we want to know who you are, we need to know your office and your person. And when we talk about the Son of God, 
If we move to the book of Hebrews chapter 1, you will see the definition of what it means to be the son of God. I, I want to digress and just touch that a little before we go back to Matthew chapter 16. Well, it's a long journey we are heading for, a very long journey. Hallelujah. Okay, help me. Are you there? Um, Hebrews chapter 1 says, God who has sundry times and in diverse manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So, are you there? Then from verse 2, huh, he now defines his son. Whom he has appointed, number one definition. Are you, are you with me? It is his son that he has appointed heir of all things. Inheritor of all things. It is his son, it is by his son that he made the worlds. That's number two. Number three. This his son is the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of his person. What's the meaning of that? What's the meaning of the brightness of the glory of God? Okay, well, so that I will not, will not waste time. That means the definition of God. If God is going to be revealed, he will be revealed in his son. For the glory of God is bright in him. He is the one that reveals God. So Jesus is the clearest definition of God. Are you with me? So, are you, or you are not with me? Let me explain what that means. Do you still remember the scripture? that says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. You remember that scripture in the book of John chapter 20? So that scripture in the book of John chapter 20 gives us an idea of how Jesus was sent from heaven to come to earth to fulfill his earthly ministry. So the same way the Father sent me, that's the same way I am what? Sending you. And then what did Jesus do after he made that statement? The Bible said that he breathed on them. He breathed himself into them as the spirit. Think about that first before we make progress. He breathed himself into them as the spirit. That means when Jesus was to be sent out of heaven, the Father breathed himself as the Spirit into Jesus. Are you, are you following what I'm talking about here? So, Jesus was carrying the Spirit of his Father. So, the description of the life of Jesus is sevenfold. I hope you know that the book of John is the book of life. Do you know that? I hope you know that the book of Matthew is the book of the kingdom. Do you know that? I hope you know that the book of Luke is the book of the universal grace of God. What's the meaning of that? You think they are the same books? <laughs> the book of John is the book of life. The reason why it is called the book of life is because John was conducting a research about Jesus. And John said, in him was life. And this life was the light of men. And this light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So the book of John is an investigation into the life that Jesus had. Are you there? If we study the book of John, I'm going to show you 18 manifestations of that life. That's the story of the book of John. Okay. 
18 manifestations of that life. Jesus revealed that he could do nothing of himself. Have you seen that in the book of John chapter 5? It's what he sees his father do, that is what he does. Do you understand the meaning of that? It means that Jesus could not be creative. No, creativity was not part of his job description. It was not his idea. His ideas, his brilliant ideas was not part of his ministry. His ministry was to give expression to his father. So anytime he hacks into his father's thoughts and he finds out what his father wants, that's what he does. So his own preferences were not important. His own innovation was not important. His own style was not important. It is exactly what he perceives the father doing that he does. His own will was not important, even though he had a will. That will was perfectly surrendered to the will of his father. So the kind of life that Jesus lived, he lived to give expression to his father. So if you hear Jesus speak, that thing you are hearing Jesus say is not Jesus' words. He's giving expression to the mind of his father. Can you say that? That's what the Bible calls the brightness of the glory of God. In Jesus, his father became very visible. It was not Jesus that was visible. It was his father that was visible. Do you understand that? Or oh, you, you don't get me? You are not following me. If you don't understand this, then you don't understand that the life of Jesus was his father. He lived his father. He gave expression to his father. That was his life. The father was his life. But in the New Testament, Christ is our own life. The same way Jesus lived his father and gave expression to his father such that Thomas came to him and said, you've been talking about your father, your father. Just show us the father and then we'll be satisfied. And then Jesus became disappointed. He said, I've been with you this long and you have not yet known me. He said, I decided by an act of my will to submit even my own will to the father so that everything I'm doing this is the father that you are seeing manifesting through my vessel. For if you have seen me, he said, you have seen the father because I'm not living for myself. I'm living for my father. Do you understand that? I was in the oil industry in Nigeria and I was very good at my job. And my job, my salary for one month could pay my house rent, half of my salary could pay my house rent, my annual house rent for one year, half of my salary could pay it. I could walk into a car shop any month of my choice and buy any car I want because my salary could take care of that. I was not poor. My great father was not poor. I was not born, I don't know poverty. Do you understand that? So why I came to Jesus was not because somebody said, I'll get something. Yeah, so I'm just telling you my own story from this perspective. Some of you came to Jesus because you heard he gives, uh, he gives donuts, he gives stuff. <laughs> Are you following that? So I grew in the ranks because I will not take a bribe. You can't buy me. My commitment to Jesus was much more than my commitment to the job. So it was my yieldedness to Jesus that was my expression on the job. And then when I was supposed to become manager, and you know when you become manager? Jesus, you have a big table. Oh my God, with too much money. Too much money, you become crazy because so much money. So it was just two weeks for me to become a manager. 
write an exam, and then if you pass, you become a manager. Pass mark was 70. I knew I had already passed. Because my area is academics, knowledge. Ash. That's my area. So, two weeks to the exam, Jesus now comes to me and says, resign. Let's go to the nations. What? And I told him, I said, okay, won't you be happy if one of your followers is a manager? <laughs> won't it add glory to you that he's a manager, but it's for you? Are you with me? As far as Jesus was concerned, what he wanted was resign. So if I want to live for him, it means that I will have to do what? Resign. He, he saw the, the possibility of his follower becoming a manager. He didn't want that. What he wants his follower to do is to what? So when I resigned, my colleagues, my name still appeared in the exam. All right? My name still appeared in the exam because they had already compiled the names, finished everything, mobilized before I... So I was the only one that was missing in the hotel where the exam was supposed to take place. So all my colleagues gathered together. I didn't know that they gathered together. They gathered together. And they got my friend to call me. The one that they know that I'll pick. If not, if, if you call, what, what is that? We know how to keep the phone for it to be ringing from now till tomorrow. So they got my friend to call me. He said, where are you? Are you on a crusade? He said, no. You're not on a crusade. Why are you not in for the exam? I said, ah, I resigned. Then there was, everybody was quiet. Then they caught the uh, call. And they said, the witches that have been casting out, the demons, are the ones that have finally caught up with me. Do you realize that if you are going to live for Jesus, that's how you'll be misunderstood by him? If you are going to operate as the son of Jesus, it means that you are going to give expression to Jesus and not to your will. If we look at your life, who do we see? Is it you? Your wisdom? Your emotion? Jesus did not have the luxury to allow his emotion to, to, to dent the portrait of the father that he was pushing out. So Jesus was a theater where the father could stand and manifest himself. So that's what it means when we say he is the son of God. It's the brightness of the glory of God. It's the theater where God could display his will at liberty. And there was no distortion in the manifestation of his father in his witness. So everyone that saw him, the personality they were seeing through him was actually the personality that was within him as the spirit. And that personality was his father. Did you get that? So the great confession of Peter captured two aspects of the life of Jesus. Thou art the Christ. That was his ministry. He was the chief turn of the administration of all divine purposes. For instance, if someone is not born again, are you there? It means Christ is not in him. What we mean by that statement is that God's seat of administration is not in him. Because God's seat of administration is not in him, God cannot exert his authority on him. And the implication of that is that God cannot fulfill his divine purpose through his life. He has a destiny in God, but he has not come under the influence of God's administration. And because of that, that destiny he has in God cannot be fulfilled. And for those of us that are in Christ Jesus, if, if Christ Jesus cannot exercise his government over your life, your, God's divine purpose for your life cannot be complete. 
What do we accomplish? Are you there? Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Son of the Living God. Meanwhile, that's not my where I'm going. I just, it's just, I just passed through that place. You will now discover the reason why Jesus was silent until he asked the question, who do men say that I am? He was silent because his heart was pregnant with a revelation. But in order for him to divulge that revelation, he will need to know if there is someone that has discerned him for who he is. The revelation of Christ, Jesus Christ, is going to be the trigger that will cause Jesus to speak about the things that he has on his heart that he has kept secret. So the moment Peter hit that mark, struck that chord, and said, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God, he was excited. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. It was my father, you know, that whispered into your hearing. Then he now told Peter, now, you are no longer Simon. You are Kephas. Kephas, the pebble. Kephas, the stone. Are you there? And upon this Petra, upon this rock, and the rock he was referring to is the revelation of Jesus. The reason why he had to get to Caesarea Philippi for him to bring out that revelation was because Philip the Tetrarch was a civil engineer that was appointed governor over Caesarea. So when Philip came into power, Philip, as an engineer, wanted to give the entire city a facelift. So uh, old houses were demolished, uh, new pavements were made, um, and then, because of his efforts in, 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 in Caesarea, Caesarea was named after him, therefore. Because the Caesarea that existed before is different from the Caesarea that existed after Philip. So it became Caesarea of Philip. It was his creation. So, when they came into that coast, you see building materials, you see paint buckets, you see um, cement bags, you see iron rods. The kind of things you see when construction is going on. So Jesus came into that environment where there was construction before he began to ask the question, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? When, when Peter hit the mark, then Jesus now began to reveal what was in his heart for which he administered the question here. Upon this rock, I will build my church. It's just saying that the same way Philip is a civil engineer, I'm also a civil engineer. I'm into building. But just like Pastor Jimmy is into building, Jesus is saying, I'm also a construction man. But the foundation upon which my construction is going to be based is this revelation, the revelation of me as the Christ. Are you there? The revelation of me as the Son of God. Two things that will guide our building. If we know the revelation of him as the Christ, and, we, and I'm not talking about intellectually, knowing it experientially, and I will explain what that means. The revelation of me as the Son of God. That is the Petra upon which the church is going to be built. And if the church is built on that Petra, he says, at the gate of Hades shall not prevail against it. Mm. Ah. Jesus is an object teacher, and that was why he came to Caesarea before he started talking about the church. He wants the environment to look like the subject that he wants to talk about. In the book of John chapter 4, for instance, he came and sat on a well, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Huh? The woman was not aware of the fact that Jesus wanted to dig a well in her. She didn't know. She thought it was about herself, it was about the water, but 
Jesus wanted to dig a well. In order for Jesus to do it, he had to look for a well and he sat on it. When the woman showed up, he asked for water. The woman said, ah, are, you a, are you a stranger? Jews and Samaritans don't have dealings. So why are you asking me for water? So the first insight about Jesus that she had was that he was a Jew. And on that insight level, they couldn't have dealings. Okay, Jesus said, well, if thou had known the gift of God, and he that is asking you for water, you would have requested that he gives you living water. The woman said, see you, you are saying you have one living water to give, and you don't have the container to draw the water. <laughs> Jesus said, he that drinketh of this well, he shall test again. But the water that I do give, it shall be in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, um, Sir, you see, at first she saw him as Jew. Now they, they, they well as Sir. He <laughs> said, give, up, give me this, your living water, so that I will not come here to draw again. The woman said, okay, Jesus said, all right, go and, and get your husband. Ah, he said, that's a hard one. He said, I have had five husbands, and uh, the guy I'm with now is not my husband. Jesus said, in this, you have spoken truly. That means you lie a lot, but this time, you decided <laughs> to. <laughs> in this, it's only on this matter, you have spoken truly. that I have no husband because you have had five husbands and the one you are with now is not your husband. So the woman now say, I perceive you are a prophet. See, so we, we, we started from Jew to Sir to prophet. He's digging. I don't want to. But at least you know what I'm talking about. You know. So Jesus is an object teacher. In his being an object teacher, he will, like there are some things Jesus will want to say, he will not say them until maybe there is a feast. And that feast coincides with the subject that he's pregnant with. So he'll wait for the feast to come before he begins to say that thing. There are things he wants to say, he will move to Caesarea where they are building. And he says, okay, I'm also into building. That's how Jesus is. Secondly, Jesus uses metaphors a lot. Metaphors. And you need to understand the meaning of those metaphors in order for you to understand the gravity of the communication that he is giving. Thirdly, Jesus uses parables as teaching aids. So you need to understand his style so that you can understand the import of his communication. In the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 16, where we read, Jesus spoke about the gates of Hades on this rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. That means the gates of Hades will be in constant contention with the intention to prevail. The, yes, that it's, whether you are sleeping, the gates of Hades is trying to colonize the church. Are you there? So what are gates? Because if you study your Bible, you'll find metaphors like windows. And I'll open the windows of heaven. Windows. Windows refer to blessings. Anytime you see windows used as a metaphor. It refers to what? Blessings. I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you will not have room enough to contain. When you hear of doors, and he's talking about opportunities, a great door and an effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries.
Are you there? But when we talk about gate, we're talking about authorities. Authorities, don't forget that. If you need a scripture for that, I'll take you to the book of Psalms 24 that says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the floods and established it upon the seas. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, that has not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, gates, and be thou lifted up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory will come in. All right? Yes? You will now notice that the next verse, you, there's a reply. Who is this King of glory? So the authorities respond to Jesus. Are you there? So before we define gates at, as entry points, we need to define it as the seat of authorities. Before we define it. Entry point is number two definition, but number one definition is the seat of authority. And if you are a master of the Old Testament, are you there? Are you with me? If you are a master of the Old Testament, you will discover that in Jewish culture, if cases are to be heard, if cases are to be settled, the position where the people go to sit to settle cases is at the gate. That's like what we call our parliament now. So when the Jew says gate, what he's talking about is a parliament. And I hope you know that's where laws, your laws come from. They derive from the parliament. And even though you don't like the senators that gather in that parliament. You did not vote for them. And you know some of them personally, you schooled with them and you say, this guy was a rolling stone while we were in school, you don't like his. <laughs> if he is in that parliament and they are voting, maybe he's even sick and he's shaking. I say, they can vote and make your village to be part of Botswana. In that parliament. Because it is a seat of authority. Before we call it a seat of entrance, it is first a seat of authority. So when Jesus said that the gates of Hades would not prevail against the church, Jesus was saying, and that statement is conditional. It's conditional on we pastors building according to that foundation. And if by any means we are not building according to that foundation, guess what will happen? The gates of Hades will now prevail. So the authorities of Hades will be the ones that are in charge of the things we do, and that place will no longer be the church. What it will be is a synagogue of Satan, because the word synagogue means congregation. Congregation that is held sway by Satan. So in order to ensure that the church your pastor does not end up to become a synagogue of Satan, that's why we are doing this lecture. There are seven things that must be in place to ensure that you are not running a synagogue of Satan. I took, are you, are you still with me? You know we are ministers. Can we be truthful to ourselves? I know people don't like truth these days. <laughs> so when you confront truth, then they now go pay people to go on social media and be talking. I don't live on social media. That's not where I live. I have an address. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. <laughs> but I know most of you live there. So that's what you see as reality, what is on social media. I'm in the business of truth. And it's a very difficult business in a time where people have found frat fraternized with darkness. It's a very, very risky business. Let me take you further. If you have understood me till this time, let me take you further. Because we are pastors, that's why I'm talking strong. 
right? If we're just, it's just a believers meeting, we can preach the type that you like, the one that everybody is happy. But if it's for pastors, then we need to confront ourselves with the truth. Are you there? You know, in a building, I know Pastor Jimmy can bring perspective on that. We have specifications. If you want to build a warehouse, there are specifications for the foundation. There are specifications for the kind of steel, the dimension of steel rods that you can use to weave through uh, the warehouse uh, like a skeleton. If you want to build, then um, words like dimensions will come into the equation. If you want to build, then we must do what the civil engineers call the uh, test strength of material, the tests that verify the strength of material. There are a few specifications. Building is not just, hey, let's, let's mobilize to site. No. There, it's, there are dimensions to it. There are specifications to it. So when we're building our auditorium, we got um, the people from the university to come test our slabs, test our um, gallery, test our pillars to see if the strength is consistent with the prescribed strength that has been put forth by the Guild of Engineers. So building is technical. <laughs> building is not just, okay, ah, let's, we got a hall and we have seats. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What you will be doing will be giving Satan a ground. Because you will raise a synagogue unto Satan. I don't know about you, but I've counseled so many believers. See, it was this pastor that took my virginity. That's the reason why I hate all of you. You are evil men. You work for Satan. So when I meet somebody like that, I say, yes, we're all evil men. Um, however, Can you give me three months to prove that all of us are not as evil as you? We are all evil, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe the degree of. <laughs> our degree of wickedness is, is not the same. So is it possible for you to give me three months to verify my own kind of evil? <laughs> and then we see the same people healed. We see the same people come into alignment again. And their life begins to glow. And then they come back after the three months and say, okay, I was blind by the misfortune the misfortune that I had. If in the church that you pastor, we can find 10 people that have that testimony, what you are running is a synagogue of Satan. And I'm going to show you the things you did to build that synagogue. Mm, it, it, it's a science. Building is not accidental. You don't just wake up and say, you just say, hey, the building just appeared. <laughs> hey. No. It doesn't just appear. You built it according to specification. There, there's no ignorant civil engineer. He knows what he wants to construct. He knows what he wants to build. John chapter 4 verse 44. Are you there in John 4, 44? A man that has not mastered how to live above immorality has nothing to do with the pulpit. 
exclusively nothing. Now, if we check the hierarchy of leadership in the body of Christ, the first level, the ground level, is Acts chapter 6, Dickens, the Aconite, according to the Greek. And what it means is people that take care of administrative issues. Like before we came here, someone cleaned this place. Before we came here, someone set up some stuff. Before we came here, some people did some, deployed their own ministry. And the ministry that they deployed is going to make Pastor Jimmy's job easier. So all he needs to do is to focus on his own aspect of ministry, which has to do with the ministry of the word and prayer. Now, if those other guys don't deploy their own ministry, Pastor Jimmy will come after fasting and he will begin to ar arrange tears. And that might distract or deplete what he has gathered. So the first line of ministry is the diaconate level. That is the administrative level. The second line of ministry, now the deacons don't even, according to the way it was practiced in, um, in the book of Acts, the deacons didn't do spiritual work. Even though they were spiritual people, they did administrative work. They were the ones taking care of finance, taking care of buying the fuel, ensuring that they were spiritual people, but their job description was administrative. Then the next level is the level of eldership. Eldership. Someone are you there? An elder must have served at the deacon level. He must have served in the administrative level and must have gotten the report of not being greedy, not being self-centered. Someone that can control his temper, they never saw him in an outburst. Are you there? All of these symptoms are suggestive of the fact that the spirit of Christ has grown in him, is regulating him. So he doesn't operate like any canal man that is just going around there. All right? And one of the requirements for eldership is that he must be flawless in character. Don't ever forget that. Flawless in character. We cannot say he slept with this sister he, he, he stole something no, in order for you to arrive at eldership you must have qualified and become flawless in character I was preaching in Nigeria just like I'm preaching here today and I lifted up my hands and I said if there is any lady in all the world that can come out and say I slept with her please come out yeah yeah, I say that today again. Because I married as a virgin at the age of 31. And since that time, I've not known any other woman apart from my wife. You must have that record before you can become an elder. You, 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 you see, you can become creative and run what you want, but don't call it church. Don't call it church. Because Jesus called the church his church. Jesus said he is the one that is responsible for the building. That means the building must be according to his specifications. Are you there? Upon this rock, I will build my church. So if it is his own church, it has specifications. But if it's yours, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Ah, so many things can be there, so many things. And if it is yours, you can get all the most beautiful ladies and they are the ones that are your, your protocol people. You just come with your suit and your bow tie and say, yeah, I just, I just, gone, I just came from Canada right now. Just, <laughs> you, you are on your own. What you are doing is your own thing. But if you are going to do church, for which Jesus kept quiet from east to west, before he spoke about, he had to administer a questionnaire before he spoke about church. So in order for you to become an elder, and it's only from the eldership level that you are giving custody of the lives of men. Whereas the deacon is accounting about money, giving accounts about money, about the elder is giving accounts about the souls of men. And in the apostolic community, the price for the souls of men is high. 
It's high because it cost the blood of Jesus. So someone that will have the competence and the character and the maturity to be able to bring oversight to the souls of men, you don't stumble on that. You, the, 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 you know, when we vote people into political office, we have expectations. Oh, yeah, this road, this road here, this rough road is supposed to, the government is supposed to attend to this road. That is the reason why we voted this man. The expectations that men have for you as a pastor supersedes what they expect from politicians. Now, you might think it's just, you just do your thing and you just run, you know. You are running your own, it's a synagogue. You are running. There are no standards in that kind of operation. And trust me, if you say you are a prophet and we cannot see sexual purity in your profile, you operate by divination. You know we're in Africa. And some of you must have, you know Sangoma, you have heard of, oh, you know Sangoma, you know Sangoma. So what's the difference between a Sangoma and a pastor? What's the difference? What's the difference? So if someone, if a Sangoma decides to put on a tie and to come to church and begins to minister according to, maybe knows a few scriptures, you know, can talk, can talk like, so, and, and I know that Sangomas operate with the spirit of divination so they can reveal things. Will, will you not call him a prophet? The difference between that Sangoma is that that Sangoma will need to be sleeping with people because the fuel for divination is illegal sex. So if, we, if you say you are a prophet and you are not sexually clean, <laughs> uh, we know where you are coming from. We know where you are coming from. And that corruption is everywhere. It's in Nigeria, it's in Ghana, it's in Kenya, it's in everywhere. And these so-called prophetic people, all right, they think that we fight, that we fight to ensure that there is no standard. And so when you confront the person with the word of God, the person believes that you are attacking him. If you confront a genuine believer with the word of God, he will repent. But if you confront someone that is profiting from an illegality, the person will protest. Because that's where he's feeding from, an illegality. It's unauthorized. Are you with me? Imagine that, that, um, you know, I spoke to you about one guy yesterday. He is an anesthetic nurse, and he's been in the theater for 22 years. He's seen all kinds of procedures, all kinds of surgeries. He's seen heart surgery, he's seen CS, he's seen all kinds of surgeries for 22 years. So he, he conducts surgeries. And none of his patients have died yet because he's an expert. He's seen it, but he doesn't have the license to practice medicine at that level. Are you there? Imagine, if we now come and say, okay, and maybe there are like five such nurses in this place, and we now come and I, I call one pastor there, I call the other pastor, and we are the committee that have been set up to look into that anomaly to ensure that standards are kept. So a, a real surgeon will not fight the committee because he has a qualification. The person that will fight the committee is the one that is not qualified. They will, they will gather, they will gather and start with, with placard and say, all oh, we are saying. The reason why he's doing that is because he knows that he does not qualify. He doesn't have the, the certificate that gives him the right to practice. So false ministries in Africa benefited from a system that has no standards. Part, my trouble is that I, I have an apostolic calling. And the apostolic calling is a crown office that sets, that reveals God's standards. And the moment a true apostolic personality begins to raise the standard, 
guess who the people that will, will protest are the substandard people. Oh, when, when God, when Jesus said that the gates of hell were attempt, they will be knocking. They will be trying to colonize the church. You don't know. Part of the way it happens is that unauthorized people begin to do things for which they are not authorized. Are you, are you with me? Are you there with me? Good. Do you know that after I finished Bible school in 1994, I felt I was a preacher. I was ready for ministry. I knew what faith was. I knew what holiness was. I knew what sanctification was. I knew theology in my, in my brain, in my head. Jesus now came to me and said, um, what you are preaching is poison. So he detained me for 10 years. Ah. Yes. 10 years to teach me doctrine. It was after 10 years that Jesus approved that I should teach. You see someone says a prophet, he doesn't have... The scriptures on his tongue are scanty. And you will now notice that he has more manifestations than he has revelations. It's false. Because the Lord appeared again to Samuel in Shiloh and revealed himself to Samuel by the word of the Lord. Part of God's responsibility to a prophet is that he reveals himself to the prophet. He doesn't just speak to a prophet. His first dealing with a prophet is to reveal himself to the prophet. So you listen to somebody, and as you are listening to him, you are not hearing insight about God, how to find God, how to know God. The message doesn't know God, that's why I can't reveal him. How did you become a prophet when you don't know God? You can't hold a discussion that is biblical. You can't talk, talk biblically for one hour. You, just, you are just talking like this. You just scatter. And then you come and you say, okay, your name is this, your name is that, your name is it. That's Sangoma, Sangoma. <laughs> Meanwhile, even if you are a genuine minister and all you have the ability to do is to tell people word of knowledge, that's not prophetic ministry. I hope you know that. Prophetic ministry is the ability to give direction. The sons of Visaka were men that understood the times the ability to give direction is drawn from an understanding of the times. This is what is about to happen according to the calendar of heaven. And this is the strategy to escape it, to counteract it, to defeat it. And the person that has the ability to do that may not even have the ability to mention your name. Yes, a, a, a prophet, a real prophet that has the ability to give direction may not even have the ability to say you are this, you are that, you are this. The next time I checked, the next time you check, if you check Africa with good eyes, you will find out that the number of the prophets are so few and most of them are not known. Come with me, let's, let's do the Bible. Let's do Bible. What? You say, I'm a spokesman for God, you don't know the Bible? Where are you coming from? Who raised you? Where did you give your life to Christ? We need to ask basic questions. Are you saved? <laughs> because I know places in Nigeria, if you want to be that kind of a prophet, I know places in Nigeria where you can go to and they will do things on you and then you can come and start doing that. Yes, there are places like that. The gates of hell will be contending day and night to colonize the church so that the church of Jesus will become the synagogue of Satan. Hallelujah. 
I hope you know no one can do this job I do if you are not willing to die. No one. The test of an apostle is the, is the sacrifices that he goes through for the body of Christ. That's the test. Not how many women he sleeps with. Not what he drives. Are you there with me? All right. So Jesus called it his church. So everything that goes on there must be inspired by Jesus. He must be responsible. He must be the one that initiated it, the strategy, the style. If the reason for which you started a local assembly is because there was tension, there was a fight, and you wanted to just, let's just leave this fight, and then you now left, and then started a church because there was a fight. And Jesus is not the one that inspired it. You cannot be right. You cannot, you will meet with, as you go on, you will meet with Satan. Satan we use that platform to manipulate the lives of men. Because Jesus is not the author of that initiative. There are a few things that we need to check to know if what you are running is church or the synagogue of Satan. You know, I said we should open John chapter 8, verse 44. First test is in John chapter 8, verse 44. Yeah. You can increase it a little. In John chapter 8, this is what we call the test of source. Test of source. Ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own for he is a liar and the father of it. No, stop there. Stop 44. The word that I would like you to check in the Greek is off. Not first off. Ye are off. If you have an electronic Bible, click on not off. You'll find the word ek, E-K in Greek. I want somebody to confirm it before I go on. Click on off. If you have a Bible that is supported by a lexicon, then you find E-K. Is that true? Okay. The word ek in that scripture is the same for in ek liaza. Ek liaza. Ek. And in ek liaza, the ek is out of, so called out of the world. Ek liaza. Out of. That's what ek means. Ek means source. Ek means origin. Ek means your foundation. Because you cannot have a wrong source and a right outcome. So every one of us here, hallelujah. Are you with me? As a source. Before I became an apostle, I can give you my referees, the pastor under whom I was an usher, because that was my department. How many years I was an usher? When I now started teaching 
new commerce Sunday school. Do you have a handkerchief? When I started teaching Sunday school and newcomers, that's when I found this teaching ministry, teaching grace. The people that I teach, the newcomers that I teach, they want me to be teaching them because it's, it's, it's in levels. So if I do level one, for instance, someone is supposed to do level two, or the people say, hey, where is where's that man? Where is it? Yeah, so I can show you my referees under whom I began to teach. Huh? Are you with me? I can show you the time, the season when God gave me the inspiration to pioneer a ministry. I can show you elders in the church in Nigeria that released me to go and do that job. Are you with me? It's not only God that knows. There are human beings that also know. Because we, if we cannot trace you to a man, you'll be traced to Satan. You don't have a source. And if you don't have a source, you are going to be a danger to this clan. That's how people become prophets. How did you become a prophet? That's how people become apostles. How did you become an apostle? You don't have any record, no spiritual history. There was, there's a man, there's a man in Nigeria. A man in Nigeria. Was never in any church, was never discipled by anybody. There was nobody that could come and testify about his salvation experience. Then he just emerged a senior minister. Source. What is your source? What God does is that he releases things on people, on men. And your access point to those things is by inheritance. You will notice that what we call salvation today began with Abraham. If you have ever read the book of Galatians chapter 3. The covenant that God caught with Abraham was the platform that Jesus stood on because when it was caught in Abraham, it carried on in Moses, it was an Israeli thing. But you see, what was caught with Abraham was a global thing. One tributary of it became what Moses was doing and it was limited to Israel. When Jesus came, the full scope of the covenant became available. It became whosoever. God does not build something or nothing. No. If you watch my tapes, some of them are on YouTube. You, can, you will see me when I'm a tiny boy preaching with fire. I could, yes, you, you, okay. I didn't just appear. I was in the wilderness for more than 25 years. Spiritual things take time to form. It will take you time before you start hearing God. It will take you time. Time. It takes time to form. It takes time to form. Because he's an IT guy, all right? That's why I called him. So you are going to assist me. Hmm? And because of his surname, I like his surname, so I, I got him. He started assisting me for six years. Just assisting me, you know? Then in London, I said, preach today. He was operating the same gifts that I operated. He can do what I'm doing. 
not because I called him and started teaching him John chapter 3, verse 4. I just asked him, assist me. Just like the Dickens assist. And then because they are assisting, what you carry, you know, they will inherit it. So you must have a source. You will hear the Pharisees asking Jesus, by what authority do we thou these things? So if, if I bring my father and the Lord here, you will see that the, the, the way he operates, what he has, I have it. He has a, an impeccable lifestyle. So I cannot do less. He do, he's not fighting with his wife. So I'm not fighting with mine. Because you will look like your source. You will behave like your source. It is only in Pentecostal Christianity that we don't probe source. Even witches probe source. They say, this is your type, this is your texture of witchcraft. Who is your father? Then they say, ah, from the hills of Zimbabwe. Then, oh, okay. Ah. Before they extend the right hand of fellowship. But for us, someone will come from somewhere, a Sangoma will just coil his hair and say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And what is coming to pioneer is the synagogue of Satan. If the church in South Africa is going to rise, then our quotient of discernment will need to increase. The church must come to a point where just anything cannot go because we are a people that have specifications. Satan will want us to be people without specifications so that we just, okay, we see visions too. The reason why there can be many witches in the territory, but you'll never see them publicly fighting and agree, disagreeing in public is because there's order. Yes. If you violate their laws, they oh my. So everyone is in order. But we have people that are rolling stones. He doesn't have a reference point. He just appeared. He just came. And he's now the sensation of Africa. Ye are of your father, the devil. Jesus, when he wants to probe, he doesn't, he doesn't probe at face value. He probes source. So the first test that we need to do is the test of source. Let me give you a scripture to unveil that test. Let's go to the book of Acts of the Apostle, chapter 16, verse 16. There, I have... I have seven tests. Are you with me? Well, because of time, we'll do one. We'll do one today. Test of source. Give me Acts 16, 16. Source. That's the first test. And it came to pass when we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us. It because a lot of us will think that because the lady is possessed with the spirit of divination, she can attend the main service, but she will not come for the prayer meeting. You, you are joking. The Sangoma wants to take over that prayer meeting in that church so that the prayer meeting will be powered by Sangoma. You, if, if that happens, it will be easy to kill the pastor. So she came for prayer. But her source was the spirit of divination. 
And this is her record. She brought her master's great gain by her soothsaying. So if we trace the person's history, we can actually trace it to the Sangoma altar. Yeah. So where is it coming from? Who raised him? Because if the person that raised him is false, it's also false. We don't even need to check him. If the person that raised him is false, he's a, he's, he's a very more terrible version of false. I hope you know that there are improvements along the lines of generations. Yeah. If the person that raised him is a thief, you don't need to check him. He's a thief. It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her master's much gain by so saying. Yeah, next verse. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. We show unto us the way of salvation. Now, can you see, can you see this? This statement? You cannot use the Bible to fault this statement. So there are dimensions of deception that you cannot check with, with, with Bible study. Because what she's saying is true. But as you will learn very soon, there's a difference between true and truth. Truth is different from true. For instance, someone is sick. It is true that the person is sick. But the truth is, he carried our sicknesses and he bore our diseases. True, different from truth. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. That's truth. But the headache is true. So she came with true. Next verse. And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit. So Paul went beyond her words that were true. She went to the spirit. So the Holy Ghost in the spirit, because the experience he had here was grief. The Holy Ghost in the spirit of Paul was grieved with the utterance. The utterance was true, but the spirit of truth was in Paul, and that spirit of truth was grieved by a true utterance. Many of you people judge people by true, not by truth. If we bring the judgment of truth, bring the perspective of truth, some of the things we celebrate will curse them. The spirit of God in Paul was grieved. And what the spirit of God was saying is, those words are not from me. They are true words, but they are not from me. It is something else that is speaking. And the moment you accept it, you come under the authority of that thing that is speaking. And then you become the synagogue of Satan. Because that thing will still continue to speak and begin to give you directives, begin to tell you what to do, begin to, ah, and before you know it, you are breaking, broken ties with the Holy Ghost and you are on another journey, another tangent, another trajectory entirely that is inconsistent with what God has for your life. If we cannot conduct the test of source, then we are in trouble. So that's number one, source test. Are you there?
Number two, I'll stop at number two. Number two is what we call principle test. Principle test, the test of principle. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 to 22. The test of principle. By what principles do you operate? There are principles that derive from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can even have a genuine calling and begin to use principles from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You will have a fake ministry and Satan is going to be have access to your ministry. It will create a habinga for Satan to hide and to operate because even though your call is genuine, you have decided to submit to principles from another source. We need to do the test of principles. This was after the flood in the book of Genesis chapter 8. Ah, are you there? I told you to go to Genesis chapter 8. Oh, man on the console. Genesis 8.20. Is it possible? It's not possible. Okay. I've never seen this thing. Does it take so long? Is it so difficult to... No, I don't know. I've no, I don't know it, but... I, okay, after the service, I'll go and check. What if it's so difficult to change it? Jesus. <laughs> and Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered bond offerings on the altar. Next verse. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore every living thing as I have done. Yes, 22. While the earth remained seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Okay. After the flood, Noah did something that I would not have done if I were Noah. Noah took some creatures. They were called clean creatures. Are you there? It will interest you to know that the man that downloaded the lexicon for clean creatures and unclean creatures is Moses. So this guy has access to that lexicon even before Moses came. Think about it. The guy pulled out of the stock of clean creatures and he offered the sacrifice unto God. And I need to explain to us what clean creatures are. What's the name of that boss? Um, Baloy? That boss, the boss that we saw, that one you were talking about, is used for what? Quantum. Is that what you call it? It's like town service. Not the Texas, but the, it's, a, it's a bus. Okay, I saw some buses on the, on the street, sir. So you could use those buses as a means of transportation in South Africa. I confirm that. But if you don't know the name, I cannot help with, with, with that. <laughs> that bus, if I'm not mistaken, is an 18-seater bus. Yeah? Okay, okay. At least we have in agreement on that matter. Imagine that that 18 seater bus has an accident and it tumbles eight times. Three people died. Four people broke their bones. One person broke his skull. Three, two people were unconscious and then three people now come out without a scratch. The first question we need to ask is, were they in the same bus? Huh? But the impact of the accident on each individual was dependent on where he was sitting. 
That's how the fall was. The fall happened to all of creation. But the impact on the, of the fall on each animal is different. Some, the fall had no impact at all. The way they were ordained to operate according to the original manual, that's how they are. So those are the creatures called clean creatures. And man was not one of them. Yes, because a mutation, the mutation, the impact of the fall on man created a mutation. He became a creature that was diverse from God's original intention. So he was most hit from the fall. Do you need scriptures for that? Okay, come with me. You know, the reason why I'm, I, I want us to be using scripture is so that we'll have a reference. Because this day, somebody will just come and say, you know, uh, You know, Adam was not the first man. You know, you know, you know. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. And that's, that's a service. I am here because God has said Christians on the continent of Africa Right? Whether they are Africans or not, but they are on the continent of Africa. Those are the Christians he wants to use right now to set a pace for the global church. And Satan knew we had that potential. What he did was that he released Sangomas in mass so that the church of Jesus on the continent will be largely the synagogue of Satan. And when God comes, when the timing aligns, <laughs> We'll be so messed up in corruption that we cannot tell between what is holy and what is unholy, what is profane, what is sacred. And even though it is our time, we'll be in, we cannot take advantage of the window because we're in a mess. So the impact of the accident was different depending on where they were sitting and how the car was flipping, the, the mo momentum of the movement of the car, the velocity and the centrifugal force that was on it will determine who gets what. So clean creatures maintained their manual. The way they were ordained, that's how they are. So the guy now took clean creatures out of the stockpile. He sacrificed them. That's what, I wouldn't have done that because you, you labored 40 days and 40 nights to preserve these things only for you to show up at the other side and say, okay, you want to sacrifice. But it seems Noah had more insight than I, I do. And it's only clean creatures that he sacrificed. What exactly is the utterance of his intercession. He was saying to God that I don't know what you did to these creatures that they fall did not affect them. Can you do that to us so that life on earth will be predictable after the fall? Do you understand his intercession? You did something to these creatures. The fall did not affect them. Can you do something so that we can operate on earth without the pressure of the fall? God now said, okay, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will be constant. Are you there? So if you know how to interact with all of these variables, you can have a life that is predictable. That's where the law of sowing and reaping was established. Are you still with me? Do you, can you, can we analyze us? Okay, you know what I'm talking about here. God decided to invest power in principles as a means of giving us a predictable future. So part, some of his power, he invested them in principles. 
Yeah? He invested some of his power where? In principle. Now, so let us look at all those variables and see which one we can influence. You cannot no longer influence day and night. It was, it was Joshua that influenced it. He took a day out of February and manipulated our calendar. And that's why we still observe leap years. God is not likely to change the calendar again. Because when Joshua said, sun, stand still, moon, stand still, it's not just the sun and moon that stood still. It's Saturn, it's Uranus, it's Mars. The entire galaxy stood still. If not, there would have been a collision if the sun alone stood still. If, if. So one man by an act of authority. And the Bible recorded that God had never honored the voice of a man like that. So that's an exceptional case. And you don't build your life on exceptions. So the galaxy is too still. And it took a day out of February. And it won't happen again. So no, no need to exercise your faith to achieve that. <laughs> so day and night is not a variable. It's a constant. Eh? Are you there? Cold and heat. You cannot predict. This cold we are in now, according to your prediction, we are supposed to be in serious summer. In fact, somebody called me and said, ah, the heat is too much. Look for clothes that are light so that you don't. Then we don't look for clothes that were light. And when we're in Addis Ababa, they say it's five degrees. I say, oh my God. <laughs> and unfortunately for us, even the clothes we even packed, the bags didn't come. So we we because no one can predict cold and heat. But the only variable you can influence is seed time and harvest. In that mix-up, he said, I've invested some power in principles. If you decide to operate the principles, you will not need to bind principalities. Because there's power already rooted in the principles. So every principle you operate, there's power rooted in it from a certain source. If the principle is divine, then there's divine power rooted in it. If the principle is demonic, then there's demonic power rooted in it. The moment you begin to operate the principle, the power that is responsible for the principle will begin to become your operating system. You see, when you decide to go to the farm and you cast a seed to the ground, you have casted the seed into a principle. You no longer have authority of the outcome of that seed. It is the principle that has authority on the outcome of that seed. Are you with me? You sowed into the principle. It is the principle that will produce the result. So, if I, as a pastor, I don't mind using the principle of manipulation. You know, we all need money. Huh? Anybody here that doesn't? Oh, you don't need money. <laughs> we, all, we all need money. You need money for ministry. But someone that is rooted in Christ Jesus, you only have limited principles on how to get that money. You only have the principles that are rooted in righteousness. So manipulation is not an option. So it's possible, you know, my, one of my friends was telling me something. Uh, somewhere in Europe, somewhere in Europe, some of the best preachers on earth were invited for a conference. So one of those preachers came with someone. And then the church said, well, you didn't tell us you were coming with this person, so we cannot take responsibility for this person. We asked you a few times, how many people are you coming with? You said you are coming alone, and then you now came with someone. It's not on our budget. So that, my friend, was a protocol officer that was supposed to take that preacher 
to the hotel. When they got to the hotel, they told the preacher that, sorry, uh, we do not have any provision for this person. Can you people stay together? I said, no, what's that? Oh, gee, what? okay, no problem. When I get to that meeting this night, I'm going to raise money that will cover her. So, then guess what happened? I don't want to mention the name. All of you know the uh, preacher. The preacher came to the pulpit and I said, the Lord Jesus spoke to me. He told me that if you can give a seed, there will be a miracle. Guess what the congregation will say? <laughs> and it was like a movie. The guy was wondering because <laughs> so manipulation was going on. And it was so wonderful. It was done in the name of the Lord. Meanwhile, if there is a need, and I come and say, okay, there's a need. We, have, we need to do this. Anything you can give, allow the Lord to touch your heart, consider making a donation. That's honest. There are times when God calls for a seed. If God is not calling for a seed, don't say the Lord. Just say the need, you know? We have a need. We have a need. Can you do something about it? I'm also making my own contributions. This is how much I am putting aside so that we can meet this need. And then it becomes a community thing. But the woman came. Oh, sorry, the preacher said, Ah, how did we get there? The woman, okay, you say woman. Oh, the woman. There are so many women preachers, so you, know, you can <laughs> say the law. That's a principle. It's a principle of manipulation. It means that in her ministry, manipulation is allowed. The principle you use has its own power. It will produce its own results. You cannot determine the results it will produce. Because the principle is superior to you. You, you wanted help, so you came to the principle to help you. So the principle will help you the way it wants. According to the life that it has. According to the spirit that instituted it. And you must know, I know you know, that when it is witchcraft, then one of the strategies, the principles available is manipulation. So you can have a genuine calling and then you use witchcraft principles. What it will produce is that your church will be bewitched. And that's why Paul was asking who bewitched the church in Galatia. It was not because there was a witch. It was because there were principles that were adopted that gave the spirit of witchcraft the opportunity to begin to infest on the congregation. The second test is the test of principle. I can tell you how we built our building. I can tell you exactly this is how we did it. This is how we did it. We never say, if you can give a million rand, stand up. If you can give, come for prayer. If you can give uh, one million rand, there's an anointing we'll release on you. If you can give 500,000 rand, uh, there's another anointing, but it will not be like the uh, one million anointing. You take something there. Uh, uh. So I can tell you how we built our, our, our building. I can tell you how I got all the cars. I didn't buy any of the cars in my compound. They were given to me as gifts. I can tell you the source of every dime I spent. I never lied to anybody. And I'm on air. So if there's anyone that I lied to, sh shout, shout on Facebook. Never lie to anybody. Never even lie to my wife. I didn't promise my wife a good life. No. I didn't come to say, you know, if you come with me, there's a life. No. <laughs> I told her, this is, my, this is the way I proposed to her. I told her I'm a preacher, a minister of the gospel, and the way I preach, I'm not likely to prosper much. And please say no. That was my proposal. <laughs> I, I'll bring her, I'll bring her, I'll bring her the next, you can ask her. My, I ended the proposal by telling her, say no. 
Oh, you need to, you need to know me then. I was Elijah then. Oh, I won't shake a woman. And I don't smile. So, is that my wife that has turned me into this guy? She's the one that has done. She has done a good job. I, you need to see me then. I was lean like an AIDS victim from fasting, dry fasting. But my spirit was anointed. You can't be my friend. You can't. You can't. I will, it's only when the Holy Ghost witnesses. There's no need for us to shake. No need for us to talk. I was a, a strange man. So you can imagine that kind of proposal. It's not a normal man. <laughs> I didn't lie to her. She knew what she was coming into. That this one, this is how it is. And I was still a classroom teacher when I proposed to her. So I didn't have any money to give. And because I was radical about my Christianity, so many people in the family were not so interested in me. So I went through the wilderness completely. I fulfilled my time in the wilderness. It was by the voice of God that I rose. He, he, he gives me direction. He said, do this. I do. He said, do this. Wait. Move now. Yes, that's how I left the wilderness. And he brought me to lamplight. So my voice is not bought. It's not bought. It's not bought. If I tell you the truth and you reject it, I've done my job. <coughs> My voice is not bought. I paid the price. And when a man pays the price, he can say something. <coughs> yes. Yes. I came from the wilderness. I came from the desert. There's no form of suffering. You say you, you are suffering today that I have not suffered. Much more. Satan was on my case. He wanted me to deny Jesus. So he was on my case. Yes. He was on my case. I simply ignored him. And he hated that with passion. And he wanted to prove a point. I stayed true until God came and lifted me himself. And all the people in my family that were wealthy, uh, placed, highly placed in society, that you would expect that they would help me out, all of them abandoned me. Jesus raised me up. My loyalty is to Jesus. Because the principle by which you rise is the principle by which you are shaped. Yes, so things might be hard for you. Don't cut corners. Wait for Jesus so that you can remain his messenger. It's his hardship that make people violate the principles of God and become fake. You know, there's a difference between being fake and being false. If you are false, it means you are using another spirit. But if you are fake, it means when you, you came face to face with the process and you felt the process was too harsh, so you decided to adopt some other principles. So you survived by a new set of principles that are not consistent with the spirit of Christ. You are fake. You cannot produce Christ-like Christians because your preaching system is based on principles that are not in Christ Jesus. You can't produce it. You can, you can blend the place, you can blend colors, you can bring air conditioning, you can wear expensive suits from Jojo Armani. You can coil your hair and do all of that show, but you, will not be, you are not a minister of Jesus because you did not grow, you did not rise by the principles of the kingdom of God and the principles of righteousness. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. If there is anything called the doctrine of prosperity, that scripture is the basis of that doctrine. That as you are preoccupied with kingdom things, focused on kingdom agenda, then God causes financial and material resources to navigate in your direction so that you have the capacity to prosecute the vision that God has placed upon your heart. If, you, if your own prosperity has any other definition apart from this, it came through a wrong principle. 
These are the days when the only thing we look at is that he has arrived. We don't ask, how did he arrive? Nobody wants to know the principles. Did he kill? Did he give his first daughter for sacrifice on the altar of Sangoma? Nobody wants to know. What people want to know now is that he drove in with Range Rover. Range Rover Sport. 2024 edition. And he came out with a limp. Yeah, they say, yeah, that's the guy. That's how I want my pastor to look. Heaven does not know him. He denied Jesus the day he decided to take the principles of Satan as his ladder, his climb up into visibility. So that's number two. I'll stop here so that we can do the question and answers. There are, there are, there are five, more, five more checks. So we, we celebrated people that should be quarantined. People that the body of Christ should gather, the elders should gather and, and excommunicate and say, these ones, we do not know from whence they came. Those are our heroes. Say, so, yeah, okay, hallelujah. The Bible says that in a great house there are many vessels. Some to honor. And some to dishonor. But if a man shall purge himself of these, he shall become a vessel unto honor, sanctified and qualified for the master's use. For the foundation of the Lord standeth sure, the Bible says, having deceived you. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. He's saying you cannot do Jesus with principles of iniquity. So the story of the recovery is that men will purge themselves. And just in case you have stains, you, that's where you came from. You came from a synagogue of Satan. You, it's possible for you to purge yourself. He, if you purge yourself from this, you can become a vessel unto honor. A vessel unto I'm talking strong because we are pastors. If we are not pastors, I know how to talk. There are other things in the Bible. But if you are also a shareholder, a custodian, then we must know the language of songs. Let everyone that name it the name of Christ depart from iniquity. These are the days when a pastor will commit immorality and he's still celebrated. And his people will be saying, yeah, man of God, you are my prophet, you are my guy. And then you think that thing will be accepted in the sight of God. You joke, you lie. You lie. There is a new wind blowing on the land. And this new wind that is blowing on the land will be catastrophic to anything that doesn't have its roots in Jesus Christ. For the Lord is going to raise his hand over the continent. The spirit of judgment will go out. The voice of Baal will be blotted out. And the tongue of the strange river will be cut off. The spirit of divination will suffer loss. As the spirit of Christ begins to rise. We are at the verge of the most interesting moment of history. God is about to come back to the continent. Jesus came to Egypt for hiding. During the days when the principalities were manifesting, manipulating Herod. He is coming back again to his continent. He's coming back to stir up the hearts of men. Because his house must be delivered from the scourge of darkness that has weighed heavily upon it. Grace will be given to his sons and to his daughters. They will preach, they will pray, they will prophesy until revival comes. So while you are on your feet now, we want to pray in the spirit for a moment. Because a little one will become a thousand. A small one will become a strong nation. Though your beginning be small, your later end shall greatly increase. The time has come and now is 
where the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So strengthen the hands that hang down. Strengthen the feeble knees so that they that are dislocated will be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no eye will see God. So follow me now, apresco, bagado centoria baminde, zico beso non bela cade, apply con zaman and dedi, escopri ma casqueto de bacadela, agai son sala, i compre, zima ne cotela, apresco mina santelia, a cabon genende, i cobamina i tocombelasi. You are one of the ministers that God wants to use to pioneer the age of righteousness. Kobise Embosani Bagabonga Bais Presco Bemandantelia Ademambrose Racosa Cobondo Raca Santa Baboria Ica Mesiade Brasqueto Conde Malacadi Analana Lababas Laico Sico Belli Mandela
in the name of Jesus. Listen to me. When you study the Old Testament, you'll find a certain word. It's called high places. High places. That's where the shrines were built to other deities. High places. The challenge that Israel will always have at the high places. Where shanks are built. Sangoma Islands. Where the spirit of divination is. Where you can consult other spirits. The city steps. Where the necromancers are. They are the high places. What the devil wants to do is to turn your, the church your pastor to a high place. So that when people come there to consult, the God they meet is not Jehovah. High places. The high places of Africa. The high places of Nigeria. The high places of Botswana. We want to pray this morning and say, Lord, bring down the high places. The houses of falsehood. The synagogues of Satan. Can we cry as ministers of the gospel? Bring down. Bring down. Bring down the high places. Bring down the high places. the name of Jesus. So we'll go to the question and answer session. If we still have time thereafter, then I can ask the Lord to anoint us afresh. But if there's no time, we can always do that in the evening. But hear me, old minister of the gospel. The gates of hell want to prevail against what you're doing.
Satan wants you to use his principles. He wants you to have a wrong source for your wealth, a wrong source for your power, a wrong source for your protection. True priests ensure territorial integrity so that nothing profane can come into the civilization. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Take your seat, take your seat. Um, if you have any very, very relevant question as a minister ministering on the continent of Africa, any very, not just trivial questions, write it down. Let's see the ushers. Ushers, can we see you? So these are the ushers, you write it down. But we'll take just five questions so that we don't get lost in talking. We'll take five questions. So if you know your question is not so important, no need to put it down. So you write your questions down and, um, is, that, is that Laura? Oh my God, God bless you. Oh yes, you are in SA now. All right, so I'll see you after the service. So you write um, the question down, the ushers will pick it up, and the usher, oh, no, 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 it's, it's like a throne, like I'm sitting on, you just put it by the side somewhere there, let it not, let it be on the same level so that uh, it will not look like I'm, I'm a chief. Okay, so... Um, You write it out, give it to the usher, and um, what? Okay, so you write it out, give it to the usher. The usher will pass it on to Pastor by the side, and uh, he will read it out. Pastor, you also deserve a seat, so you oh. sit here so that you can read out the question. You investigate the question, you confirm that it's relevant before you read out the question. So we have just a few minutes to do that, to take five questions. And um, I submit to take this to answer questions. If we agree that you know that I don't have all the answers, only God does. If, if that is the agreement, then I will now agree to answer questions. So that means if there's a question that I cannot answer, I will tell you, I don't have any answer to this question. What well, God does, so we we'll turn to God and, and uh, ask him to respond to the questions. Now, just, can you see, I know you like, you like seven, but today I say sit. Amen. Sit, okay? It doesn't mean just because you got a question, you will read it out. Read it first and, in fact, give the questions to Pastor Jimmy, let him approve. Then the ones he approves, he'll give you, and then you can read Yes, we'll take five in all. We'll take five in all. And uh, we'll trust God to help us. Okay, someone on Facebook is YouTube or something is, is challenging my message. Uh, you know, so in question and answer time, it, 
debates. We are open to debates, okay? Um, our elders and our fathers in the faith, they used to do doctrinal debates so that people would come with evidences to establish claims on the basis of the gospel, of, of the Bible, okay? So this guy is saying, um, so David, who slept with Bathsheba, isn't an elder. Abraham, who slept with Hagar, isn't an elder. Okay, that's the person. Abraham and David. Okay. Um, let's use the Bible to, to answer the Bible. The status of New Testament Christianity is regulations are very, very far removed from Old Testament regulations. It will interest you to know that in Old Testament regulations, polygamy was not an issue. In New Testament regulations, if you are going to be an elder, stay with me, are you with me? Yes, According to the New Testament, you must be a husband of one wife. Now, you must understand when Apostle Paul is giving a descriptive exposition or a prescriptive exposition. You know what it means to prescribe? Huh? So, Apostle Paul gave us prescriptive qualification for elders. And one of the prescriptions is that an elder must be flawless. Second prescription is that the elder must be a husband of one wife. So if you are going to be in the business of overseeing souls, you must be a husband of one wife. If you are not overseeing souls, you can have more than one wife. But yeah, <laughs> you say an elder must be <laughs> a husband of one wife. Are you with me? Because he's overseeing souls. One thing you must understand is this: if you had two wives before you get God give your life to Christ, you paid bright price for the two women. You can't, those two women are your wives. Are you with me? You cannot be an elder because of that. So if you were born again, you had two wives. You came into the kingdom of God with two wives. You cannot be an elder. If you are born again, you cannot marry more than one wife. Are you following what I'm talking about? I'm just trying to open the broad Strokes. Do you like the broad strokes? I'm opening the full page for you so that you will see what I'm talking about. If you were an unbeliever, you married two wives, then you came to the house of God. You have two wives. You cannot be an elder. If you are a believer and you marry, you cannot marry more than one because we are hoping that you will become an elder. Do you understand that mix? I've not finished. I'm just giving you the prescription. Unbeliever, two wives. You become a believer, you have two wives. You cannot be an elder. You know why? With your two wives, you have at least 12 children. That means you are the pastor of that. that your household is a church. <laughs> Am I making sense? So you are the pastor. You have enough responsibility pastoring your household. You have like 12 children, two women. It's a full-time job. It's a full-time ministry. You are already in ministry. <laughs> are you there? All right, so, so if you were married to two women before you gave your life to Christ, you cannot be an elder in church because you have a lot of responsibility of discipling your own children. 
if you are born again and you get married as a born again person, you cannot marry two women. If you do, you will no longer be qualified to be an elder. You are still a church member, but you will now move to become a normal church member because you are going to have to pastor your household. Is that clear? You are not following me. I say, is that clear? Did you get it to that point? Now, so that I will know we are on the same page here, um, if anybody here has a different view, you can speak. An elder must be the husband of what? Oh, yeah. We want it on tape so that people that will watch, ah, give him volume. So I've not finished answering his question. I'm just giving us the prescription of the New Testament. And we must understand the, when Paul is describing and when Paul is prescribing. Because the vessel that God used to give us perspectives about the divine order is Apostle Paul. So we will follow his prescription. So if I had two wives before I came into the, the fold, I'm already a pastor in my household. So I cannot take on additional responsibility to pastor the church. It will strain me and my children will become vagabonds. And part of the requirement for you to be an elder is that your children must be in subjection to Jesus. It must be evident. So I won't have the ability to maintain my household while I'm trying to do ministry. Because I have a church where? Amen. Do you get that? That's the prescription. I've not come to answer the question. I just want us to, if there is any view different from raise it, and then we'll now enter into scriptures. Okay. Yeah, so the following question is related to the same man who married two wives before he's saved. Okay. Can the same man be called by God into the fivefold ministry? That's a follow-up question on the same man. The, the, the Lord has liberty to call anybody. But whether you can fulfill a call is dependent on the prescription. Because you must understand that there are two things God gave us. God did not only give us the Bible. He gave us the Spirit. And the Spirit and the Scriptures must be in agreement before the will of God can be done. So you receive your call by the Spirit, but in obeying that call, you will need what? To align with the Bible. Is that clear? I want to answer the question. I just brought this is marriage an issue in South Africa? Yes. No, Pastor, okay, you help me. You be using your eyes to talk to me. That When you do like this, if you close your eyes, it means stop. I will stop. So let me tell you again. Because somebody might say, okay, now that, are you there? Now that an elder, if you want to oversee people, you must have one wife. To me now, I want to resign from being an elder. <laughs> Wonderful me. <major. laughs> wait, wait. Are you safe following what I'm talking about? If the man mistakenly marries another woman, he, he ceases to be an elder. Because he has a church at home. Even if he bullies everybody and still maintains that pulpit, I will never sit under him in my whole life. Because he doesn't have the authority to be on the pulpit. He doesn't have the authority to shepherd people. The, the scriptures and the spirit must agree before the purpose of God can be done. So this guy, can we, can we ask the guy on Facebook to give us New Testament examples of people that fell into fornication and still held on to the, to the pulpit. Do you have a way of talking to him? Talk to him. Because he's part of this service. 
So this is the synagogue of Satan that we are talking about. This, this kind of man. Where are you there? We want to do God's things, not with God's principles. We are offended at God's principles, but we will not leave God's things. We won't leave. We were there for life, but we will not subscribe to the principles of God. That kind of arrangement is what produces a high place. Are you there? So, ask the person to bring New Testament saints that held onto the pulpit after the one case of immorality, second case, third case, fourth case. So, you now know that it's not a weakness. It is a strategy to keep the altar serviced. It's not a weakness. Because if the person falls into immorality, the practice is that the person is supposed to leave the pulpit because immorality is contagious. It's a spirit that, that is responsible for it. You leave the pulpit and you submit yourself to people that have authority in the body of Christ. They will, they will, they will, they will midwife your restoration. And the process of restoration will ensure that that spirit that was responsible for that failure is no longer at work in your life. If not, what you'll be doing in your ministry is transmitting the frequencies of that spirit and everyone will become a very, very terrible fornicator. You get that? So ask the person to give us New Testament examples of people that fell into sin and still held on to the pulpit. I can't see this your thing. Yes, uh, that brother wants to say something. Thank you so much, Apostle. Uh, Do you know that I know God more than Abraham? No, you don't know that. Yes. I know God more than Abraham. Abraham didn't have a Bible. So everything about God he knew were encounters. I have encounters and I also have the Bible. My life is more precise in revealing God's ways than Abraham. So Abraham cannot be my reference point for God's sake. Are you still, now, are you following? I'm trying to be as open to you as possible. And I'm not against someone not believing my position. No, I'm not against that. Because Paul says, I disputed. That means in arriving at accurate doctrine, sometimes we can dispute. We can contend. But, but when you see someone that is in the synagogue of Satan, you confront him with the truth. Instead of him to bring the Bible and dispute, huh? he, will, he will go on social media. And, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no. That's, that's, that's the synagogue. That's the synagogue. We dispute. We can disagree. And that will not become enemies. Because I'm not the custodian of all revelatory powers. I can be wrong. But if you want to correct me, correct me with the Bible. Exactly. So, if you are in pulpit ministry, you travel to Jamaica and fall in love. And before you know it, you came back with a lady. You know what you need to do? Do the noble thing. Come down. Hand over. And then pastor your household. Are you there? Okay, somebody is coming, another person from the online community. He says, Jesus never condemned anybody. That what Jesus does is that he just raises disciples and then asks us to go preach the gospel. Now, you see that you see that we were led to treat the topic we treated today. Let us, let us see the typical issue of adultery. The woman was caught in adultery. Meanwhile, the guys that were even trying to serve her justice were not, they didn't have the, the right to serve that justice. They didn't have the right because there are two parties in, in, a, in an adultery situation and they wanted to execute judgment on just the woman. Where's the guy? 
I want to believe that the guy was among the people that was carrying the stones. <laughs> Where is he? The guy had already had political influence with, with, the, with the leaders. So there's okay. Uh, where, is, where is the woman? Oh, okay. <laughs> so Jesus said, Where are the people that have accused you? The word there is accused. Then they are no, it's okay. I, I do not accuse you. But go and sin no more. That was forgiveness that was done before the cross. So Jesus used a credit card. You know, we have credit cards and debit cards. In a credit card, you, you pay for the goods and then you pay later. In a debit card, you, you already have the money and you use the money to pay. So that was a credit card. He paid for her forgiveness and then he gave her forgiveness and he went a few days later, actually two days, to now pay. It's a credit card. Go and what? Sin no more. So he was able to, she was able to achieve forgiveness with Jesus with the instruction, sin no more. Are you there? Is Acts of the Apostles chapter 5 New Testament? Is it New Testament? Okay, in Acts chapter 5, the Holy Spirit did not only condemn sin, he killed the offenders. Uh, are, we, are we still here? Okay, so. Is that Old Testament? Uh, <laughs> Now, so this is what the synagogue of Satan preaches. It's open-ended. So Satan can be a member. Abaddon can be the choir leader. Jezebel can be the prophetess. So when you set up a system that negates the divine order and negates the prescription that Jesus gave and the principles he unveiled, what you are running is not church. You, have, you are in league with Satan. And in the days in which we are, the spirit of judgment has already risen. Are we on the same page? I'm open to correction. You know, I told you before we start the exercise, let us agree that I don't know everything. All right? That's what I told you. And that's the only reason why I will submit to do question and answer. If you agree that I don't know everything. So you can ask a question, I don't know the answer. I say, I don't know. But the ones I responded on, I know. I know the will of God on that matter. Yes. So as I am now, I cannot go and marry another woman. If I do, Pastor Jimmy, don't invite me again. Because you only follow a man. Followership in Christianity is conditional. If you are following without a condition, you are running a cult. It's a cult. You are, you are into occultism. Because if the man does evil, you are still following him. He kills somebody, you are following him. They say, it's loyalty. You are, you are in a cult. You are in a cult. Because the Bible says, follow me as I follow Christ. It means the day I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. Yes, that's how it is. The reason why you are following me is because I model Christ. You see Christ revealed in my life. The, the moment you can no longer see him, you are not under you. You are not under any obligation to follow. You want them to follow you? You are a murderer? They follow you. Follow you? You are an adulterer? They follow you. You are running on a different principle. And what we have is a synagogue of Satan. If you don't want to hear the truth, don't, invite, don't call me. A pastor one day wanted his church to grow and he said, this guy, when he comes, if crowds come, then he, he called me. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost said, mene, mene, tekel. Yes. <laughs> 
So I, I made the enemies. I made because I will say what he put on my mene, mene. I'm the voice of one crying from the wilderness. Yeah, I'm the voice from the wilderness. Make straight paths. Prepare the way. The mountains must be humbled. The valleys must be elevated. The stones must be gathered out. So that there can be a plain road for Messiah to come. So if you don't want Messiah, don't call me. Mene, mene. Take care, For thou hast been weighed in the balances and found want. I hope you know there's no prophet offering in that kind of arrangement. So go with your own transport. <laughs> go with your transport. Yes, second question there. Or you still have some online people that are interested in. Yeah. Are you are you with me? Okay, as I'm preaching like this, some things that God says to me in secret. Are you with me? They are true things. But he did not ask me to say them. If I say them, I'll lose my peace. What I said is true. What I said is the Bible. But he did not ask me to say them. I didn't do anything wrong in the Bible. What I said was true. But in my relationship with him, he did not authorize that saying. I lose my peace. So even though you clap for me, when I get to the bedroom, I, I prostrate. And I will not stand until he says, it's okay. I will not stand. I will not eat. I will not drink. I will remain prostrate until he says, I saw. I will not go to the room and, and now say, um, if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us. I've confessed. I'm wrong. Hey, uh, mm. It means you believe God is a robot. He doesn't have feelings. You don't know him. I will be there prostrate until he says, it's so. And the moment he says that, my peace is restored. Because the God we serve is not in a book. He's alive. Now. Your relationship with him must not be plastic. It must be living. Remember, there are two things he gave us. His spirit and the Bible, the scriptures. Praise the Lord. Most of these questions, Apostle, you have already answered in the teaching yesterday, even today. So I will just read a few. This one says, you previously made a prophetic utterance that as a nation, we are behind schedule. What are the insights in order to strike chord that is required for our delivery? We need a conference for that. Amen. <laughs> Number two, is there a yoke that no matter how you pray and fast, you can't break except by a greater man of God? Yes. Yes. Uh, we are not the same. We are different. Our difference is in one, the anointing. The anointing on you is different from the anointing on me. And the anointing on you has specialization. There are things you can handle that I, like, I, the way I see both of you so quiet. You have the pastor's grace. Eh? I know. I'm not a pastor. I, you, you should have known that. <laughs> I'm not a pastor. So I don't have the temperament of a pastor. As you, are, you are so patient. I'm not that patient. The anointing that I have doesn't allow me to be patient. 
So you can sit with somebody for four hours, you are hearing the story, trying to find out this, you try to do that, and then you now take prayer points home, and you are praying for the person, you, you book another appointment, it's okay, the Lord told you this, why not try this? We are not the same. So there are areas, there are people we should send to you because of your grace, and there are people you wish would, you should send to me because of mine. My own breaks, it kills, it cuts off. Mm. Are you there? Yes. So that's, that's my own. So if you want to break something, you are my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Who can? I, I, I know, you want to break something today? Yes. So, it, so you see, anointings operate differently. So it, it's not, the terminology is not greater, but different. Right? Because we can have one anointing on various levels. Like the anointing that was upon Elisha was a double portion of the same anointing. And obviously, a greater measure of the same anointing is going to do greater than a smaller measure. And in, but in most cases, what we really need is a different anointing. Amen. Yes? What is the way out of spiritual wife? Hey! <laughs> spiritual wife. Or husband. Okay. Um, in the realm of the spirit, uh, we have unions. Unions, that's the doctrine of inclusion. Right? Um, there are three aspects to the ministry of Christ. For instance, we have the incarnation, we have the inclusion, and we have the intensification. The incarnation was when Jesus came and lived like a human being, and he showed us an example of what a man should be like. He gave us an insight into what God had in mind when he said, let us make man. Jesus, in his incarnation, was exactly what God had in mind. Is that clear? On the cross, something happened. By an act of God's authority, he included us in Christ. So we came one with Christ. So it is possible for you to be one with his spirit. Do you still remember Peter? Peter? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He picked it from the Father. A few verses later, Peter adjusted his position of alignment and began to transmit from Satan. So Jesus rebuked Peter as if he were rebuking Satan and rebuked Satan as if he was rebuking Peter. Because at that point, he was one with Satan. Is that clear? Oh, you're not with me. At that point, he was one with Satan. Just like now we are one with Christ. So you can now understand what halotry means. I want to be with Christ, but I still want to be with Satan. In that situation, what is going to happen is that Christ will leave and Satan will become my God. Because the name of God in the Old Testament is, is jealous. He will not share you. With, so halotry doesn't work in the kingdom of God. That's why holiness is a call to separate unto God and God alone. That's how it can work. If you add another one, you will leave. So having explained the doctrine of inclusion, because in the Old Testament, in creation, you are going to see God as a spectator in his creation, separate from his creation. But in the New Testament, you are going to see God in his creation, one with his creation. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, As many, huh? give me first 6, 17. First Corinthians 6, 17. Ah, the software in my brain just scrambled. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Yeah. You know, I, I told you I was on a journey to cram the, by the New Testament, so. Uh, but I stopped that anyway, I stopped that. But I used to do all those things those days. Um, 
Now I want to know God. So, one spirit. Can you see? A spirit can, you can be joined to a spirit. So, having said this, it is, is it possible for someone to be joined to a spiritual husband? Very possible. What are the ways, what are the things that can facilitate it? Number one, it can be an inheritance. It can be that your father served an idol and he was one with the idol and the idol, based on the transactions of your father, had authority to seek out someone else that will continue your father's legacy. And the Bible speaks about the principle of inheritance as a very valid principle. In fact, are you there? Yes. Sir. The principle of inheritance that was in view from Abraham to Jesus Christ. I, can you see the family tree um, in the book of Matthew chapter 1? It's just to show you how powerful inheritance is. So, you are born again, but you have that thing, and the Spirit was actually seeking you based on the authority of your father, that you be one with him. So what happens is now, you need to choose sides. So if I'm choosing sides to be with Jesus, and there is this thing that is trying to unite with me. Are you there? One of the ways to choose sides is to refuse to do the thing that the Spirit wants. If the Spirit wants you to commit immorality, don't do it. As long as you cannot commit immorality, the Spirit cannot have influence over you. Number two, one of the ways to choose sides is spiritual warfare. You reject it in your prayers by exercising your spirit. Number three, one of the ways to choose sides is to also join forces with someone that is anointed to, in the deliverance ministry. So by an act of your will, not choosing sides with the spirit, the person's anointing can go to work and he can function as a law enforcement agent to cut off the influence of that spirit. So are you asking if someone can be joined to it? It is possible. Through the opening of inheritance, through immorality, you can pick up a spirit that can be joined to you. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Read it. Put it on the screen. First Corinthians 7, 1. Jesus Christ. Okay, give me Second Corinthians seven one. Second Corinthians chapter seven verse one. No, don't worry, don't worry. Let it be on the screen. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. There are two kinds of filthiness. Filthiness of the flesh. There's also filthiness of the spirit. Oh, I know most of us don't don't believe that, but this is the Bible. It will take us four days to talk about filthiness of the spirit. The things that you can do that can give, make you operate under another spirit that is not the Holy Ghost. The person that has that lexicon, can you click on the word filthiness on your lexicon? What's the Greek word? Ah. Okay. We have a problem. What's the meaning? Check the meanings. Give us the meaning of filthiness. Defilement. Defilement. An action by which. What? Defilement. Defilement. So your spirit can be defiled. Another influence that is not the Holy Ghost can be transmitting through your spirit. It is very possible. And I've seen it many times. But the Bible says that we can cleanse ourselves from both the filthiness that is in the flesh and the filthiness that is in the spirit. Just in case the person that has the spirit husband issue is here, 
In the two minutes that we will have after these questions, we'll break that thing. Amen. And I'm not saying we'll break that thing boastfully. I'm saying it because I know that that is the anointing I have. Amen. Okay? Let me just take uh, this last Final question. Last one. Uh -huh. How many spiritual fathers must one have? And as a minister, is it possible to rise without a father or a mentor? If you cannot be traced to a man, you'll be traced to the devil. You cannot be, write a book without references. Because other scholars will need to attest to the fact that what you have submitted is consistent with the spirit of the body of existing knowledge. How many of you still remember that uh, Apostle Paul, as powerful as he was, he had to go to Jerusalem so that he can receive endorsement from the elders? And he said he did that because he didn't want to run in vain. Meanwhile, he was having a thriving ministry. But he had to submit what he was doing to the elders to check if this is the spirit of Christ. Because many people say Apostle Paul did not have a father in the Lord. You don't study your Bible. That uh, Apostle Paul, Peter, and the rest were colleagues. You will find Peter in his old age bringing accreditation to the ministry of Paul saying that Paul was given a very deep pool of revelation and the things that were given to him are difficult to understand. That man was given accreditation to the work of Paul because he's a long-standing apostle. Apostle Paul is much, much younger than Peter in the Lord. So Apostle Paul was using, Peter was using his credibility to validate the fact that even though the things are deep, they are, they are confusing, they are difficult to understand, they are from the Lord. And that is part of what a father does to a son, it brings validation to him. So in my own opinion, Peter was Apostle Paul's covering. Then you will find, are you, are you there? Are you with me? Oh, my pulpit has disappeared. Okay. All right, give me my Bible. Let me look for one scripture. Then I will use the scripture to reason with us. You cannot have more than one father. Is that possible biologically? No. Okay. <laughs> but wait, just wait for me. You see, I'm now laughing, so I'm, I don't normally laugh, but you people have. <laughs> the Lord will help us. Amen. All right, just give me a moment. Let me get us the scripture. Okay, first Corinthians chapter four, verse fifteen. First Corinthians chapter four, verse fifteen. Yeah. It says, Though ye have ten thousand instructors. That means there are people that when you listen to their messages, it adds to your life, it um, blesses you, blesses your calling. All right? You can have many of that. But you cannot have many fathers. The point I want to make for bringing this scripture is that there are not too many spiritual fathers in the body of Christ. You are not following me. 
There are not too many spiritual fathers. Because what makes you a father is that you, have, you disciple somebody. Because that's what we fathers do to our children. We train them, we send them to school, we teach them our philosophy, and then they become better expressions of what. We give them more opportunities, much more opportunities than what we have, because we're expecting them to become eventually better than we are. That's what it means to be a father. The reason why the child has a family, when the child was born, he had no name, he had no identity, but the parents decided to take the child in and give the child a context, give the child an environment in which the child will grow. And the child will pick up philosophy from that environment. So if you are going to be somebody's spiritual child, you must, first of all, accept the person's principles. The person's principles must be your principles. You have seen the person's position on this, on that, on this, and that's your position. It means you belong to the same tribe. Someone that doesn't have your principles, that is claiming that is your daughter, is false. Your grace will never rest on the person. Because the person does not subscribe to your values. So spiritual fatherhood is not political. Mm. There's a DNA that you carry, and the DNA that you carry has, is what is responsible for the principles that you live by. Others might say you are a wicked man, but in the eyes of the person that is from your tribe, you are a champion. And if somebody is just trying to hide under your wings to, be, to get visibility, the person will never contact anything spiritual. When the person sets out to do ministry, it will be with all the bad principles. The person will not be an expression of you because the person came not to learn your ways, but he came to take advantage of your cloud. Today, many young people like the cloud. They like recognition. They like visibility. And they believe that if they cook up with some people, they are going to stand a chance of enjoying visibility. All of that is in the flesh. God doesn't reckon with that. Are you there? I say, are you there? Yes, sir. So when you begin to function by the person's principles, function by the person's, you, you, the person, you, the person's faith is an example to you, and you are following that same kind of faith. It means that you will inherit the person's spirit. There was somebody I served under. The person loved other people. He didn't like me so much, but I served the person in spite of whether you like me or not. And the service was genuine. Huh? Years later, the grace that the person operates with was now found in my life. And all the people the person loved. So the person himself doesn't regulate how the grace travels. Doesn't. It's, it's manipulated from above. Elijah did not give Elisha the mantle. He fell. It's fair. It's not. It, so I don't even. You understand? Ah, you don't know. You don't know these matters. Mm. Uh, how much influence do you think I have? How much influence? Because me too, I received it. Do I think I have the ability to give it? No. I, I don't. They, he, didn't, he didn't say Elijah. He said, ah, you have asked a hard thing. But I will use the gift of word of wisdom to give you a strategy. If you see me. Because he did not have the authority to give him. But if you see me, when I am taken up, that's why you need to know someone that knows God. Even if he cannot give you something, he will say, do like this, do like this. If you do like that, the Lord cannot deny you. He will give you. <laughs> it's not in my power to give, but I can tell you, do this. You will give If you see me, when I'm taking on. If you see me when I'm taking on. So come on. 
Is that clear? Don't get me wrong. There are things that God has given me that I can give people. But not the mantle that I carry. I can activate spiritual gifts in you. I can activate it. Okay, like, I want, to, I want to give some people something. This one, I'm anointed to give it. The gift of discernment of spirit is what I want to give now. No, don't worry. Just We are sitting in the lecture. You know why I'm standing here? I'm standing here because the person I want to give is either here or here. And in the next 21 seconds, the gift will come on them. I, so this one, I have it from the Lord. I have authority to give this. So when I say that I cannot transfer my mantle to somebody, yes, but the gifts that the mantle can produce, I can, I can, I can give you. I have authority from Jesus to do this. You know, I was asking a sister yesterday, I said, the person that wanted you dead, what do you want me to do to the person? You know why I asked her? I have authority to do what she says. Yes. If you are a warlock, if you are a wizard, leave my people. If you, if you, if you go near any one of them, I cut you down. I have authority to do that. Just like Elijah could call down fire and consume people. You know, I, 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 you know, I told you I'm not a pastor. No, I'm not. I am not. <laughs> pastor Jim, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a pastor. So I, I can give you. There are things I have from the Lord to give. There are things I can give, but the mantle, only God will decide who will wear it. I was not, I was not preferred, I was not chosen by men, even though my service record was intact, but I was not loved, I was not desired. But the service was faithful, and it was in secret, and the Lord saw it. The Lord said, yes, your heart is good. I will strengthen you. And he did not strengthen me at once, it was a process. You give little anointing, he will test me, he will add it, he will test, he will add it to see if you will become proud, if you start using it to oppress people, if you start liking people to serve you, because you are still a servant. It is service that is greatness in the kingdom of God. It is, you are still a servant, so you must maintain the portrait, the demeanor of a servant. So there are things I can give. There are powers that were given to me. If we have a crusade and it's about to rain, call me. I can hold it. I have that from the Lord. I can hold it. If the rain must fall, it will fall somewhere there. Fall somewhere there, it will leave our ground. When the crusade finishes in the night, I will now open the, I say, okay, you can fall now. By the time I say you can fall, count for 14 minutes, 20 minutes, the rain will come. I have that from the Lord. If there is somebody that is very sacrificial in giving, is there anyone like that in the church? That is very sacrificial, bring that person. I can make proclamation and wealth will begin to operate in the person's life. No, 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 not yet. Let it be hidden. In the office, bring the person. Then I, I have that one from the Lord. Have it from the Lord. Oh, God. Thank you. It is a big thing to say you are a man of God. Because if you are a man of God, God will give you things to give people. If you don't have anything, keep quiet. Thank you, Jesus. It's a big thing. Thank you, Jesus. It's a big thing to say you are a man of God. I live for God. Thank you, Jesus. I work for God. I exist for God. So he will give you things to show that, yes, he's from me. He, 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 he makes my life exciting. So I gave him these things 
to be representing me. So now, I want to ask the Lord to release some things in your life. But listen, if you receive what you are about to receive, and you decide not to live pure, you will lose it. If you decide that you will not be prayerful every day, you will lose it. If you decide that you will not fast, you will lose it. It came by fasting. It will be kept by fasting. It came by prayer. It will be kept by prayer. It came through holiness. It will be sustained by holiness. Person is sacrificial giving. Bring the person who we'll, we'll speak, and his barns will be filled with plenty. Kaya, thank you, Lord. His presses will burst forth with new wine. Will burst forth. There are several prophets that will be activated. Don't worry, seven of them. They'll be activated in a moment. That's part of my calling, to activate the prophetic. So before I go, I will bless you. Eh? You begin to see. <laughs> Don't worry, it will happen. It will happen. You just come like this. Ah! But when you begin to see, don't say everything you see. Keep quiet. Keep quiet. Say only what he says you should say. Sometimes he wants to keep secrets with you that, you know, you just say, okay, he's my friend, I'm troubled. Can you? I want, this is what is on my mind. I tried it once, I came, he told me a secret, I came to the public with a microphone, I shouted it everywhere, I lost my peace for a long time. So, so an activation is coming. Seven of you, Seven of you, your hearing and your sight will be activated. It's already coming. It's already coming. It's already coming. It's coming stronger. 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 It's coming strong. Yeah. Yeah, that's the grace. Oh, fessy, my okay. So somebody will receive the gift of working of miracles in the next two, uh, 17 seconds. In 17 seconds. For it is not of him that will it. It's not of him that run it. It is of God. God, God that shows mercy. Somebody's hand will begin to vibrate. God is trying to press the power of God into your hand. Your right hand will begin to vibrate. It will begin to vibrate. It will begin to vibrate. It's, it's a power. It's, it's pressing it into your hands.
Kali Malonde Kali Malonde Kali Jesus. Lord, we ask that you grant that the least among our numbers might become as strong as David. Cause us to love righteousness and to hate wickedness. Cause our garments to be always white and let our head lack no ointment. Swallow up our weakness and give unto us strength. Strengthen us with might by your spirit in the inner man. Let a little one become a thousand. Let a small one become a strong nation. Strengthen us to stand for righteousness when it's no longer popular. To stand for holiness when it's no longer in vogue. We are, we are not of this world. We are a new creation. For all things have passed away and all things have been made new in us. We will not serve the flesh. We will not serve sin. We will not serve Satan. We will not serve the world. We will serve Jesus. So take away our weaknesses. Those among our ranks that find it difficult to press in prayer, let the spirit of supplication, oh my God, let the spirit of intercession, let grace beyond words, let it descend upon your people that we might become warriors in the spirit, warriors in the Holy Ghost. That the Lord might strengthen us. Yeah. 
Oh no 